Hey, what's up, my dudes? DeVeorn here, bringing you part three of our Divine Spellcasting Guide series. In this video, we're going to be talking about every Divine Spell at level three available to Cleric, Druid, and Shaman. We'll also be going over the Icewind Dale spells added by the SCS component on top of that. We're going to talk about every single spell, what they do, what they're good for, and whether or not you should be taking them in your runs. Now, just a couple quick caveats before we get started. We do play on Insane Difficulty, so everyone in the party is taking double damage. We also play Hardcore, so no saves, no reloads. If anyone dies, they're dead uh, permanently, assuming they get permanently killed. And if the main character dies, it's game over, back to Baldur's Gate 1. And finally, we have SCS installed with all of its components maximized, so all the enemy spellcasters will be casting spells instantly at the start of fights. Enemies who have are eligible for HLAs will have them and all the magical creatures in the game will have a variety of nasty tools to play with in order to make the game more challenging and more fun. So everything I say is in regard to that particular set of rules that we're playing with however 99% of what I say will apply to your core rules on modded runs as well. And I'll do my best to highlight those differences. For example, sometimes the spell will be really good with SCS, but be absolutely crap in the original game, and vice versa. It might be really good in the original game and absolute crap with SCS. I'll do my best to go over those whenever we come across them. Now, we do have a tier system set up. S tier spells are the best. These are the spells that are absolutely amazing. Take them all the time. Use them all the time because they're awesome. A tier spells are spells that are situationally amazing, or for generally speaking, they're pretty good. B tier spells are spells that are okay or situationally good. C tier spells are spells that are, for the most part, pretty crappy. You really shouldn't take them unless you've got really nothing else you can use. And finally, there are RP tier spells, which are, stands, of course, for role playing. And you really should never be taking those spells unless you're actively roleplaying because they are so incredibly useless. Alright, so we're going to go and start with the Cleric and Druid Shaman, excuse me, Druid and Shaman spells only. And uh, then we will work our way into the Cleric spells. So first spell, Call Lightning, available to Druid and Shaman. This is one of the best spells that Druids and Shamans get. S tier all the way. Has a decent cast time of 9. Will last for 1 turn every 4 levels. It will target 1 creature who has a chance to save. And this will deal 2d8 points of electrical damage plus 1d8 point of, of damage for every additional level of the caster. That is absolutely insane. That is an enormous amount of damage. That is above Flame Strike's damage. Don't forget, Flame Strike does fire damage. This is electrical. This is a level 3 spell on top of it. That means when you first get this spell at level 5, one cast will deal 78 points of damage. And then it will do it again because you get an additional bolt every 4 levels. Now granted, that bolt will only come down once a turn, right? So if you're in a really quick fight, chances are you're not going to get more than one bolt. But if you're in a fight that lasts for more than one turn, like at the Bandit Camp, for example, you're going to get quite a few of these bolts being called down. And you can cast it more than once. So you have bolt after bolt after bolt raining from the heavens. And they hit like an absolute truck. Now granted, they get the save uh, to reduce the damage by half. But even when they save, this still reliably hits very, very hard. And when they don't save, this is the only time you ever see a druid permanently kill somebody is with call lightning. It hits that hard. I've seen Viconia get hit by a call lightning for over 200 damage before. 200 damage. Granted, she's taking double damage because it's insane difficulty. But that's still hilarious. This hits incredibly, incredibly hard. And it's available at level 3. Level 3. And this scales up to 20, by the way. This doesn't cap at like 10d6 like Fireball does for mages. This stacks incredibly, incredibly high. You could literally one-shot enemies with this, even in Baldur's Gate 1. In Baldur's Gate 2, it will hit even harder. And granted, the Druid has that little bit of a block, right? 13, 14, 15. That's where their XP really starts to skyrocket, makes it really hard to get levels. But Shaman don't have to worry about that. And even then, it still hits hard even for a Druid. Now, the big caveat here is that this can only be used outdoors, right? You can't use it inside, which sucks. Uh, but you'll end up getting Static Charge level 4, which is basically Call Lightning, but indoors. But until then, and even when you get then, you still want this thing. This is still S tier all throughout the game. Latent TOB, you can use this to practically one-shot a Fire Giant. It hits that damn hard. Absolutely insane. Super good spell. Uh, obviously, it doesn't do anything to undead. Skeletons especially are immune to Lightning, which sucks. Um, but holy crap. I use this to one-shot Ogre Mages all the time. This is great for Ogre Berserkers. This works on Sirens and basically one-shots them as well, though you do have to interrupt their improved invisibility so you can cast it. Um, the Bandit Camp especially, this is great. Cloakwood, this is great for all over Cloakwood. When you're fighting the Wyvern ambushes especially, this is just absolutely magical for that. So great. Really can't say enough good things about it. It's a dynamite spell. Take it and use it all the time. It hits like an absolute truck. Probably the best thing that Druid and Shaman get for this level. It really is that good. 
Up next is Cloudburst. Cloudburst is absolute dog shit, on the other hand. Uh, also available only to Druid and Shaman. This is a really baby cloud kill spell, but it's even worse than the others. As a cast time of 6, 17 foot radius, and it lasts for 2 rounds. And what this will do is for all cold and fire dwelling creatures, they'll take 2d3 points of magic damage, and then there is a 50% chance that all creatures in the area will be struck by a lightning bolt for 2d6 electrical damage, which they can save first half, and it will also extinguish flame blade, shroud of flame, and uh, salamander auras. What an incredible waste of time. What an absolute incredible waste of time. This is an AoE spell that has a chance to do damage, and then they get to save on top of it. This part right here is absolutely worthless. Cold and fire dwelling creatures. The only time I could think this actually applies to Baldur's Gate is when you're in uh, the planar sphere and you have the uh, you have the cold salamanders and crap on the left, and then you have the fire room on the right. I think this will work towards those enemies, but 2d3 points of damage is so inconsequential as to be absolutely laughable. Laughable. I don't know, maybe this might work on the Winter Wolves and Durlag's Tower or Mage Island, but even then, 2d3 points of damage is not enough to make this decent. And granted, that hits twice, right? Because, you know, there's two rounds, but it's just laughable. Absolutely laughable. Because, again, not only do they get to save versus 2d6 electrical, which is not much, but then they have a 50% chance of being struck in the first place. Just for fun, I cast this along with a couple other of Shaman AoEs on a group of bandits before doing this video. This actually missed them all. This actually missed them all. We talked about Writhing Fog, the one that actually has a chance to slow, and then you actually have to save in addition to that small chance to slow on top of it, and it only hit two guys. This didn't hit anybody. This only lasts for two rounds. Two rounds, and it missed them all. This is a level three spell. It missed everybody and did no damage. Call Lightning, and let's assume it hit. Even if it hit, it would have done less damage than one Call Lightning on one bandit. Granted, that's overkill hitting a one bandit with call lightning but i just like to point out that this spell is single target always works and will do more damage than if this spell hit everybody on your screen unless there's like 20 dudes there and even then you're rolling the dice man this is a serious you're not just rolling the dice once you're rolling it twice and even if you manage to roll sixes both times the damage it does is fucking pathetic absolute garbage spell never ever take this and the, the hilarious part is the salamander aura those can be recast in baldur's gate it's not like they cast those once. When you're uh, fighting an Avenger Druid, for example, for Faldorn, that dude, as soon as he equips that weapon, the aura goes back up. So you can't even use this to extinguish the aura. It just, it kills me. I don't even know why this was added to Baldur's Gate. It's so worthless. It's so worthless here. Never take it. It's absolute crap. Absolute dog shit. Here, one sec. Okay. All right, what do we got next? Cure Disease. Cure Disease is available to Cleric, Druid, and Shaman. So it is useful for everybody. Um, this is an A-tier spell. Very quick cast time of one. Very similar to Slow Poison. Will target one creature and cure diseases in addition to blindness, deafness, and feeble mind. Does not make them immune. Um, but still, it's a very quick cure. And this is A-tier because you're, you'll encounter these a lot. You'll encounter these a lot in Baldur's Gate 2 especially. Mummy diseases are very, very common. Um, as we mentioned before, mummy breath is particularly dangerous. Uh, Otoogs will be an enemy that use this all the time. That nasty slow effect gets rid of. Uh, you can get rid of that with the cure disease. Uh, blindness is super common by mages. Mages love power word blind in Baldur's Gate too. Mages love power word blind, power word silence. Those are very very common. Deafness is super rare, and I'm pretty sure the game codes deafness and silence is the same, even though they technically aren't. Um, so I'm pretty sure this will work on silence effects, but I'll have to check to be sure. And obviously that's not as useful because the only people you want to cast who are silenced are wizards who should all have vocalize, if not the amulet of power. And if you're trying to cast this on a cleric, that implies that you have two clerics in the party, which I really don't recommend that either. Although you can, obviously. You can run with six clerics if you really wanted to. But I'll have to double check that to see if that actually does work. But even then, because disease is so damn common, because blindness is so damn common... This spell is worth taking. I always have at least one of these on all of my clerics at all stages of the game in Baldur's Gate 2, just because it is so important to be able to cure a disease as quickly as possibly. Feeble Mind is stupidly rare, and this does not work on chaos effects, right? So chaos, confusion, cure disease doesn't help with that. But it does work for Feeble Mind, Blindness, Deafness, and your standard set of diseases. And don't forget, the original disease in Baldur's Gate 1 that you get from gas is absolutely irrelevant. You just take a nap and it's gone. does nothing. I believe it reduces regeneration, which is absolutely hilarious, considering nobody in Baldur's Gate 1 is regenerating anyway but Kagan. So, I don't really know what the point is of the diseases in BG1, but 
you can get rid of it of a cure disease, but I wouldn't worry about it. This really shines in BG2, however. Like I said, I always have a cleric with this spell, just in case, because it's that important to get rid of diseases ASAP. Up next is Cure Medium Wounds, also available to Cleric, Druid, and Shaman. This spell is actually not nearly as good as the others. It has the exact same cast time of 5, duration of permanent. Um, obviously, if you get healed, the heal is for good. Only A is the only temporary heal, right? Um, and this heals for 3d8 plus 1 per level up to a maximum of plus 15 at level 15. The reason this is so lackluster is Cure Moderate Wounds comes in at level 2 and heals for 2d8 plus 1 up to 10. That is not much worse than Cure Medium. It really isn't. And don't forget, Cleric, or excuse me, Druid and Shaman don't get shit for level 2 spells, right? We talked about that before. They get absolute garbage. So stacking a lot of Cure Moderate Wounds is perfectly fine for level 2. For Cleric, you get some better spells, but eventually Hold Person becomes useless and you can swap that and start taking Cure Moderate. And then at level 1, you're going to be taking Cure Light Wounds fairly often because you don't need more than a couple Remove Fears, Sanctuaries, and a, and a single Bless, if that. Druids don't get anything decent at level 1 but Sun Scorch. So you really have a lot of spots for Cure Moderate Wounds and Cure Light Wounds. And then when you get to level 5, you get Mass Cure. At level 6 is Heal. And in Baldur's Gate 1, it's a very slow grind between your uh, level 1 spells to your level 4 spells. It takes a long time. But at BG2, you go from level 4 to level 6 like that. You level up stupidly quickly. You're going to have heal for most of the game if you're playing a pure cleric. And if you're playing a multi-class, even then you're still going to get 5 super quick. And with 5, you get mass cure, which means cure medium wounds just... It comes in at such a point where it becomes almost irrelevant as soon as you get it. It becomes irrelevant as soon as you have access to it. And the same thing really can be said for Cure Critical and Cure Serious Wounds. In the original Baldur's Gate, if you're playing on core mo or core rules, no mods, you can use healing in combat and put people back into the fight quickly by topping them off with a couple heal spells. That's not how it works when you're playing on Insane SCS. A Cure Medium Wounds is not going to put Kagan back in the fight. It's not going to put Corrigan back on the front lines. It's not. It's not enough. You need heal for that. You need heal, you need regeneration, you need greater restoration. That's what you use to put your fighters back into the front lines. This isn't enough. And if you take a lot of them, then you could possibly heal one up and put them back in the front lines. But you know how quickly it takes. It, you know, it doesn't take long for them to get chunked and have to run away again and start kiting. And there's so many other great spells you could be taking as a cleric, especially. So it just, it kind of kills me. It kind of kills me that this spell is unironically worse than the others. Unironically worse than the others. So for that reason, I'm going to leave it at B tier. I do take this occasionally when I want to heal to full, but for the most part, I never ever take this spell, especially not in combat, especially not in combat. It's just, it's just not good enough. 3d8 plus 1 is just not good enough. Up next is Dispel Magic. I absolutely hate this spell. This is C tier for me all the way. Also available to Cleric, Druid, and Shaman. Uh, same, I'm pretty sure the Mage one is the exact same. I'm pretty sure they both are at cast time of 6. Uh, 15 foot radius, and this has a chance to dispel magical effects in uh, the 15 foot radius. Unlike Remove Magic for Mage, however, this dispels everybody's buffs if the check lands. So this can dispel the potions you just popped on Kagan, the potions you just popped on Corrigan. This can dispel the stone skin you have on Yon or Edwin. This can dispel the chant, the protection from evil you have on Vicky, etc., etc. You get the point. Now this also works on enemies' protections, and this also works on spells cast by enemies, right? If someone throws a chaos at you, you can hit it with a dispel magic. Here's the problem. Dispel magic will have a 50% base to actually work. For every level you have on the enemy caster, it jumps up by 5%. But every level you have below the caster, it decreases by 10. 10%. That is massive. Absolutely massive. So it says here, if you're 10 levels higher, there's only a 5% chance of failure. However, if you are 4 levels lower, there's only a 10% chance of success. This is important because in Baldur's Gate with SCS, there is going to be almost no time ever where you are not under-leveled compared to the enemy spellcasters. The Veorn is level 12. The cap for mages and BG1 is 9. The cap for clerics is 8. You literally cannot catch up to him level-wise. You can't. You cannot catch up to him. It is impossible. You will always be way, way underneath him. The wizards outside, level 9, level 10. The red wizards, I believe they're level 8. Level 8 and 9. Semaj, Angelo, Angelo, Tezok, Saravok, they're all level 10 plus. The cultist guards, those are fighter wizards. They have nine in a, a fighter, nine fighter and nine wizard. At no point when you're playing this game are you going to be ahead of an enemy spellcaster. At no point are you going to be ahead of an enemy spellcaster. And it gets worse in Baldur's Gate too, right? 
every lich except Edwin's is going to come with HLAs. That means they're level 18 at least. Usually, enemy liches are level 21. On average, they're level 21. Demi liches are on average level 30. Kangax is level 37. That is four levels beyond the maximum of TOB. You cap out at level 33. You cap out at level 33 as a mage. Granted, as a cleric, you can get higher, right? You can get up to 40 and throw in a ball. And we are talking about clerics. So that's something to keep in mind. But clerics level slower than mages early on. A mage can hit 9 in Baldur's Gate 1. Clerics only get to 8. It's until level 14, I believe, that clerics actually start leveling faster and will pass a mage. At 3 million XP, a cleric is 21, a mage is only 18. But that's still not enough. That's still not enough to make this remotely reliable. Here's what happens every time you cast this spell. Let's say you get hit by a chaos effect. You're fighting uh, the guards on top of uh, the Iron Throne, right? There's a couple bards there, high levels. There's a, a couple clerics and wizards. They hit you with a chaos spell. A chaos, that means they're at least level 9, right? I believe they're level 10. I believe the bard up there is level 12. I have to double check that. What's going to happen when you hit a dis cast dispel magic is you're going to dispel everything on your party and the chaos is still going to be there. I've unironically killed my own party members by casting this spell in the past. There have been at least two occasions where people have gotten chaos and I said, you know what? I'm risking it for the biscuit. I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to cast dispel magic. The only thing I did was dispel uh, Jan's stone skin and he got permanently killed two seconds later because he no longer had stone skin but was still confused. This spell is horrendously bad. And like I said, throughout all of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, you are going to be lower level than your enemies. Always. Always. The only time this becomes viable is on a bard like Herdalis, who's going to be leveling way quicker. Or on Keldorn as an Inquisitor, assuming you don't have the Inquisitor Dispel Magic nerfed. Inquisitors Dispel at twice level, right? So if they're level 15, they're casting Dispel Magic at level 30. That's great. Really, really strong. Bards, I think uh, if in Keldorn's level 15, I think Herodolis is 22, maybe 23. So it's decent. You have a much better chance of landing it. Not all the time, but you have... I would get to the point where I'd say it's almost reliable on Herodolis. But even then, you want to use remove magic, because when he casts dispel magic, ain't nobody in your party going to resist that shit. Say goodbye to your buffs. And one more thing I want to talk about before we move on, because I really hate this spell, but I do want to reiterate it just in case people haven't seen the arcane video. The way this works as a check is it will check separately for every single person who cast buffs. For example, if you're Edwin, you throw up 10 protection spells, you got stone skin, mirror image, etc., etc., and then Vicky gives you protection from evil and chant. There will be two separate checks, one for Edwin's spells, one for Vicky's. If both checks are successful, everything gets dispelled. If Edwin's check fails, but Vicky succeeds... Then Vicky's spells get dispelled, both of them, but Edwin's spells are still there. If Edwin fails the check, but Vicky's is successful, all of Edwin's buffs are gone, but the protection from evil and chant that Vicky cast is still up. There are times where you cast this spell, or it gets cast on you, that you lose a buff or two that somebody else casts, but you keep some of the other stuff. There are times where you have potions up on Kagan, for example. And he gets hit with a dispel magic, and all of Vicky and Edwin's spells are gone, but he still keeps his potions somehow. So there's a separate check for everything. There's a separate check for, I should say, not for each individual spell, but the set of spells cast by the wizard, right? There's one check for Vicky's spells, all of her spells, one check for Edwin, all of his spells. So if the check is successful, they're all gone for each caster, but if it fails, they all stay up. So you don't have to ever worry about being throwing out a dispel magic on a wizard and saying, gosh, I sure hope it gets his stone skin. If it, if it works, it's going to dispel everything. This spell will also go through Minor Globe of Invulnerability. This will go through Dispel, uh, excuse me, uh, Spell uh, Deflection. This goes through everything. The only way this spell is blocked is through Spell Immunity Abjuration and the combination of Entropy Shield and Impervious Sanctity of Mind that clerics get later on. That's it. If you don't have Spell Immunity or Entropy Shield, Dispel Magic has a chance to hit. That's the only way to become truly immune to this spell. So, I know it's a lot to unpack right there. I think I explained everything about it. I know it's a little bit confusing, but the the real point I'm trying to make with this spell is I have used this many times in the past trying to make work out of it, and every single time it has bit me in the ass at worst or done nothing whatsoever at best. If you're trying to remove enemy spells, use remove magic. If you're trying to remove a spell that an enemy cast on you, there are better tools to play with. Exaltation is perfect for getting rid of confusion. Cure disease, we already talked about. Getting rid of blindness, etc., etc. There are better tools for you to use to get rid of shit cast on your party than Dispel Magic. This is a very dangerous spell. It has killed me many times in the past. I do not recommend it. So for that reason, just like the mage version, C-tier. Don't use... I never use this. You can if you want. I typically don't. 
Um, it also will dispel the uh, the effects of grease, web, stinking cloud, etc. Although it will not dispel the area of effect, obviously. Um, if you want to dispel area of effect shit, you have to use um, uh, what's the word? Zone of sweet air. Although that obviously doesn't work on a uh, web. So C R C tier all the way. I've talked enough about it. We have a lot of spells to cover, so let's keep going. But like I said, I don't like this spell. If you're able to make it work, great. I typically found it to bit me in the ass way more often than not. So up next, hold animal. What absolute dog shit. This is available to uh, cleric, excuse me, druid shaman only, so clerics don't get it. This will target one creature and any enemies within four feet. So this is like hold person, but worse in every way. Hold person will hit a variety of enemies. Hold animal only hits a few. It lasts for two rounds per level, so it lasts a little bit longer. They save in the gate, of course, and they don't get a penalty either, which is hilarious. No penalty. The thing that this would be really great on would be like wyverns, right? Wyverns, edder caps, you know, carrion crawlers, on kegs. Those would be great. Every single one of those are completely immune to this shit. Every single one's completely immune. What what animals attack you in this game besides bears? I'm so confused. We have Charm Person, Charm Mammal, and Hold Animal. Both of these will literally only work on bears. It 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 confuses the hell out of me. I don't know what the point of this spell is. And it doesn't work on werebears, by the way. They have MR. This doesn't work on werebears. So I'm so confused as to why this even exists. What do you cast it on? Sirens are humanoid. Exvarts are humanoid. Kobolds are humanoid. Gnolls are humanoid. Those aren't animals. Dogs, maybe? Wolves? But I mean, at what stage in the game are you casting this shit trying to hold wolves down? And don't forget, undead wolves are immune to this shit. Undead people can't be held. Undead are immune to hold. Hilarious. Hilarious. So if you want to use this on a vampiric wolf, it doesn't do shit. It doesn't do shit. So I don't understand this. I don't understand why it's here. Absolutely worthless. Don't take it. Unless you just, like, actively role-playing. I wouldn't say it's RP tier, because I guess it will work if you're fighting a polar bear, and everybody's spells are exhausted, and for some reason you accidentally fat-fingered memorize hold animal and you have it up, it might be able to save you there. But, such crap. Such absolute crap. Up next, Invisibility Purge. Uh, normally, when there's a spell that does the exact same thing at a lower level, in this case, there's a mage spell at level 2 that does the same thing, but it's cast faster. This would be considered a C-tier spell, but I don't think it's that bad, and I'll tell you why in a second. This is B-tier spell for me. This is available to Cleric, Druid, and Shaman, so everybody gets it. Divination spell, although that doesn't really matter. Very long cast time of 8, and the area of effect is 120-foot radius, and just like Invisibility Purge, um, detect invisibility, or that you get at level 2 as a mage. This will purge uh, potions of invisibility, uh, sanctuary, improved invis, shadow door, uh, mislead, etc, etc. All the standard invisibility crap. This isn't like true sight, this won't get rid of mirror image, but anything that makes somebody invisible will be purged with invisibility purge. The reason this is actually B tier and not shit tier, despite its ridiculously long cast time, is because you can combine this with invisibil with detect invis that mages get in order to basically break a thief out twice. What typically happens in Baldur's Gate in Baldur's Gate 2 especially, and also when you're fighting Slythe and a couple other enemies in BG1, is enemies will go invisible at the start of a fight. And then when you first hit them out with a uh, Detect Invisibility that mages get with level 2, the 3 cast one, they'll immediately chug another Invis potion. And you can't cast another Detect Invis with that mage. And if you're playing with Edwin like I always do, he doesn't get this at all, right? So that's really your one chance to get them out of stealth. And if they immediately chug an Invisibility potion, at that point... It's dangerous, right? All it takes is one backstab to basically blow up somebody, right? We've all seen what happens when thieves are... What happens when thieves actually get a backstab off? It does ridiculous damage. We've seen Mazzy get one shot, taking 180 backstab. We've seen Vicky get hit by a plus 100 backstab. I've seen Kagan explode through 120 backstab from Slythe. It's hilarious how much damage it does on Insane Difficulty. It's hilarious how much damage it does. So you've got to be ready for it. But the reason this is so good is because you can actually combine it with detect invisibility that mages get so if you have a mage casting the the three cast one and you have a cleric casting the eight cast one what will happen the three cast goes off first the thieves get dispelled then they chug a potion and then this goes off one second later and dispels that potion he can't chug another potion for another six seconds his action for the round is gone and now you have six seconds to wail on him and beat the shit out of him because thieves are squishy as hell and they're going to go down in two seconds if they're not invisible so by combining this with the mage version, you're actually able to make them both so much more effective than they normally would be. And True Sight's the same way, right? If you cast True Sight, it will dispel right away, but they'll immediately chug a potion and go back invisible. Immediately chug a potion and go back invisible. And then you're just sitting there with your dick in hand for six seconds, right? Praying that they don't backstab somebody. 
But with using Invisibility Purge at the same time that a mage is casting True Sight or Detect Invis, you can actually break them out and keep them out long enough to, to deal with them. And for that reason, I'm leaving this at B tier. I wouldn't say it's A tier, because if this is your only way to break Invisibility, uh, chances are they're going to get a backstab off before you actually cast the spell. Hell, you might even lose the Cleric trying to cast the Invisibility Purge in the first place. That's happened to me more than once. I have lost Vicky more than once on the Amazon Ambush trying to cast Invisibility Purge, and she just does not get it up quick enough. It's just not quick enough. But when you combine it with the Mage spell, this becomes so much, so much better. So much better. For that reason, we're going to leave it at B tier. Up next is Miscast Magic. Miscast Magic is an interesting spell. This will target one creature, decent cast time of five, last one turn, and uh, the creature will summon an 80% uh, will suffer an 80% chance of spell failure, and they can save versus the spell with a negative two penalty. So this on paper looks really good, but in actuality, I find myself never using this. One, you get summon insects later on, which is way better. And two, this is a level three spell. So just like insects, if they have a minor globe up, this does absolutely nothing. If they have minor globe up, they're completely immune to this. And granted, with the insects, they are too. But I'll talk about in a second why the insects is actually better. So, the reason this spell just isn't as good is you have better spells to deal with mages. If they don't have a minor globe up, and you're a cleric, you're going to be casting Silence 10, uh, 15 foot radius. That's a level 2 spell. If you're a druid, you're going to be casting Summon Insects, which is way, way better. So I don't really feel like Miscast Magic actually has a role. You have two spells that are same level or lower that do the same thing, but better. And when that happens, you just have no choice but to put this spell at C tier. There's just no reason to ever be taking the spell over the others. There's just not. There's none whatsoever. A silenced creature can't cast, period. I guess you could argue that enemies who can cast Vocalize like mages, for example, are going to be able to cast Vocalize and break uh, a Silence, but they can't do that with uh, Miscast Magic. However, like I said before, most enemy wizards are going to be running with Minor Globe anyway. What you really want Silence for is for the occasional wizard who does not have Minor Globe up, in which case, you know, summon or uh, AoE Silence works damn fine, and same with Insects, or you're using this on Clerics, in which case the Silence and the Insects are way, way better. So it just it kills me. I just I find there's really no reason to ever take this spell. There's no reason to really ever take this spell. I'm not a big fan of it. There are other spells that do the same, but better, and I'll talk about those in just a little bit. So C tier all the way, not a fan. Up next, Mold Touch. This is available to Cleric, or excuse me, to Druid. I always say Cleric and Druid for some dumb reason when I mean Druid and Shaman. Druid and Shaman only, added by Icewind Dale, and this spell is actually pretty nasty. Decent cast time of six will target one creature. If they fail their save, then they will take 46 damage, then 3d6, then 2d6, then 1d6. If their save is successful, they still take damage. It's 2d6, 1d6, 1d6. So no matter if they save or not, they will take damage. And then the mold has a chance to spread to other creatures. Each round after the first, which means there's only three if they uh, fail their save and only two if they um, succeed, this has a chance to spread, just like Insect Plague does. Now this is not as guaranteed as Insect Plague, which comes with a massive penalty. But this is only a level 3 spell. And if they fail their save, and they'll be infected by the mold at full strength. And this will process will continue until the mold fails to infect a suitable host in time. And creatures obviously who are under the effect of the mold can't contract it again. Ground mold quickly dies once the spell is over. But here's the thing. These spells tend to be really nasty against um, pretty much anything. Not just wizards, but thieves clerics, literally anything you can cast this on because almost every enemy in the game with the exception of early Baldur's Gate 1 is going to be coming in a group. The Iron Throne has like 12 people up there. The Cultist Guards, there's going to be 6 of them, if not more. Enemy groups of Exvarts, Gnolls, uh, Sirens, everything in the game comes in packs, right? For the most part. There's very, very few fights that you'll only be fighting one dude. Tarnesh, Transig, uh, Grey Wolf, that's pretty much it. Slyth and Kristen, you at least have two. Deveoran obviously is by himself, but he summons a buttload of guards. And this damage is surprisingly impactful. Surprisingly impactful. 1d6 doesn't seem like shit, but the fact that this is hitting so many people and spreading and spreading and spreading is just, it's amazing. It's amazing how much damage this can actually do. Because as soon as you cast it, it goes off and spreads all on its own. You don't need to manage it, right? You don't need to manage it. As soon as you cast it, this will take care of itself. And you can start casting other shit. 
or you can cast a fresh mold touch and stack these things. It doesn't say that they can't be stacked. And when I last tried this, they do stack, and that's a lot of fucking damage that's being done. That's a lot of damage that's being done. And it's one of the reasons that druids actually get so damn good with the Icewind Dale spells. Is because now you got something that's absolutely ridiculous to deal with single target enemies, called Lightning. And now you have something that's actually really good in dealing with AoE packs. We talked about how shitty their AoE spells were before, right? Cloudburst is absolute dog shit. But Mold Touch is actually really, really good. It's actually crazy it's good. Now you do have to get in melee to land this spell. But the cast time isn't that long. Six isn't that bad. Six is not that bad. That's three seconds of real time. A little bit longer. About three and a half. And that's really, really strong what it does. Really, really strong. And for that reason, I actually rate this spell S tier. I think that might be rating it a little high, but in my experience, this just does an enormous amount of damage. An enormous amount of damage. Enemies will very rarely be saving for this, despite them not getting a penalty for it. But because it can hit so many enemies, and because you can keep doing it, it just you'll you'll quickly overwhelm large groups of enemies with this spell. Quickly overwhelm large groups of enemies with this spell. And that's really you don't really have a lot of spells in the game that do that, right? There aren't a lot of spells in the game that do that. I guess you could say, well, if you can compare it to one fireball spell, you know, the fireball is going to do more. But this is party friendly. So you can have people fighting in melee, walk up and cast this on an enemy and just watch it spread through. This is great for the Iron Throne guards, especially because they have those nice big clumps there. There's so many times you can use this. So many times you can use this in Baldur's Gate 1, especially. And it still does a fairly decent amount in BG2, although you really got to be careful about sending your uh, druid or shaman into melee in Baldur's Gate 2. But you still can. You still can, especially once they get Iron Skin, right? Then you could be a little bit more bold in casting this shit. But, like I said, does a lot of damage. I was very surprised with this spell. I thought it was going to be crap, but after playing with it and reading it through, um, it's actually quite good. Quite good. So, S tier, maybe a little bit too high of a rating for the spell. Might be a very weak S tier, but I think it's better than A tier. I think it's actually good enough to where, if I'm playing a druid, I will take this a couple times. Especially if I know I'm not going to be outside. Especially if I know I'm not going to be outside. If I'm going into the Cloakwood Mine, Mold Touch is amazing. Really, 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 really good. Alright, up next, what do we got? Moonblade! What an absolute waste of a weapon. Moonblade's another Conjuration weapon. Uh, cast time is 6, lasts for 2 turns, so quite a bit longer than most. And it actually uh, considers itself a plus 4 weapon, but only for what it can hit. This does not give it a plus 4 Thacko bonus. When you're using the Moonblade, you're striking at base Thacko, which is horrendously bad. It will do 1d12 plus 4 points of magic damage and plus an additional 1d12 points of damage to undead all magic. And if you successfully hit somebody, all spells the target casts in the next round are going to fail. Here's the thing. You're not going to hit anybody with this. You're not. You're using base Thacko. Bonuses from strength do not apply. Just for fun, I cast this outside. I cast this outside. On a level 5 shaman, my Thacko was 16 with this spell. 16. 18 strength, 16 Thacko. You see the problem here? What are the odds of me actually walking into melee and la not only landing a strike, but then not dying on top of it? The fact that it has 1d12 points of magic damage is irrelevant. That's almost nothing. You don't want to rely on weapon damage as your base damage. What does damage in Baldur's Gate 2 especially is the weapon enchantment and your strength bonus. Those are reliable as hell. The 1d12, this means you can roll a 1 all the fucking time. And if you're not fighting an undead at all, this thing hits for 5 damage. 5. 5. If you have 19 strength, or using draw upon holy might, for example, and you're just using a regular old flail, you're going to be doing more damage than this weapon could actually do. That blows my mind. That blows my mind. That this is a spell that doesn't allow strength bonus. If it did... This spell would actually be very, very powerful. Granted, you lose the Thacko, but there's other ways to get around that, right? You can pop potions. You could use a variety of consumes if you're a multi-class to make your Thacko a little bit better. And then you hit for a ridiculous amount of magical damage and then strength damage. But the fact that strength is gone, you're losing Thacko bonus from specialization if you're a multi-class. You can dual wield it, just like the other crap, right? You can throw a weapon in your offhand. But what the hell is the point? What the hell is the point? It just does not hit for enough damage. And if you're fighting undead, you know what works great undead? A crushing weapon. You don't need this sword. And if you're fighting a ghast or... I mean, the thing is, when you're fighting the regular undead, right? The skeletons, all it takes is one good hit from a flail and they're dead. You don't need to do all this extra damage. 
You don't need all this extra damage. And if you're fighting a Ghast who does not have physical damage reduction, you still don't need this shit because their their AC is garbage. They're going to die in two seconds. What about vampires in BG2? If you're sending a cleric or a druid into melee against a vampire, you're already making a mistake. That's what Cor Corrigan's job is for. You want somebody who's going to be immune to level drain. And we'll talk about it once we get to it, but negative plane protection sucks absolute balls in this game. It's garbage. It's garbage. Because it only lasts for five rounds. So you really can't reliably stay in melee long enough to actually make use out of the Moonblade. You just can't. You just can't. And I don't see where you'd be using this in the game. You don't want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with vampires. Vampires are way too strong. A Moonblade is not going to make the difference in that fight. You don't want to use this against Gas because this is a level 3 spell. I mean, Call Lightning will kill them instantly, right? One Call Lightning is going to kill a Gas instantly. You get no bonus to Thacko here, so chances are you just miss the whole damn time. And then Kagan kills them off. And when you're fighting actual skeletons, all you want is a hammer. You don't want a Moonblade. Because don't forget, guess who has magic resistance in Baldur's Gate 1 and 2? I'll give you a hint. It starts with an S and ends in Keleton. I don't understand this spell at all. Like I said, with Icewind Dale, maybe you got more use out of it. But in Baldur's Gate, the spell is just absolute crap. Just crap. And if you're trying to kill the base skeletons who don't have MR, all it takes is one hit from a hammer. I, like I said, I just, I can't figure out what this is doing here. I just can't. If you guys have some ideas, let me know. There's a lot of spells out of from Icewind Dale where I'm just like, what the fuck is the point of having this in this game? Confuses the hell out of me. All right. Up next, C tier all the way. In case I didn't mention that, C tier is crap. Druid and Shaman only. Garbage. Skip it. Up next, Protection from Fire. Just as equally garbage. C tier all the way. Uh, lasts for three rounds plus one per level. Cast time is six and will make a creature immune to fire and absorb 80% of magical fire. That's misleading. In Baldur's Gate, there's no such thing as magical fire or magical cold. There's fire and cold and that's it. Magical fire and cold is irrelevant. There's actually no effect or spell in this game that does magical fire or magical cold unless SCS has specifically changed that in a recent patch that I'm unaware of. For some weird reason, they just never got around to coding that. Which means that the base protection from fire that you get as a mage that lasts for a turn per level is all you need. 100% to regular fire will make you completely immune to fur crags damage, will make you immune to comet, dragon's breath, etc, etc. So, I don't understand why you have a spell that lasts for one round per level. That's the exact same spell level as the wizard one, which lasts for one turn per level. That spell won't wear off until you go to bed. This is going to wear off before the fight's over. If you're trying to fight Furcrag and cast this shit, you're not going to kill him before this wears off, dude. And chances are, you're not going to have enough spells to last to cast this on everybody all over again. Just like the Resist Fire and Cold from level 2, there's just no time where you'd ever want to use this. There's a better replacement, which we'll talk about in just a second here. There's just... It kills me. It just... It absolutely kills me. It's so crappy, man. I'd love to say there's a great time where you could use this. If you're playing without a wizard, maybe, if you're solo, and you need protection from fire because you're fighting, you know, a high-level wizard or fur crag or something, that's, that's really the only time I can see this being useful, is if you're playing solo. But I don't play solo here. I find solo play too easy and too boring, and we don't do that. So if you are playing solo, you can get some use out of this, but if you aren't, there's no reason to take it. Wizards are going to do this way better than a cleric or, excuse me, a cleric, druid, or shaman ever could. Not even close. Not even close. C tier all the way. Definitely don't take. Big skip. The duration is key here, guys. The duration is key. If this lasts for one turn per level, this would be just as good. Possibly an A tier, maybe even an S tier spell, just because fire damage is that damn common. But the fact that it's such a short duration just makes it absolutely worthless. Big skip. Okay, what do we got next here? Rigid thinking. Oh, goodness, I'm about to sneeze. Gotta mute my microphone here. I think I'm coming down with the Kung Flu, boys. I got the Mu Shu Achu hitting me hard. Okay. So, rigid thinking. Where's the music? There it is. Okay. So, this will target one creature. Cast time of five, decent cast time, lasts for one turn per level, and it will basically confuse them. That's all it does. The victim will randomly wander, attack the nearest person, or stand confused if they fail their save or spell. Underwhelming as hell. You get confusion at level four, which is fairly close to this. You get chaos at level five, which comes with a minus four penalty. I think confusion is AoE at minus two. This is no penalty at all, only targets one creature. If you're fighting one creature, you know what's really good for killing it? Call lightning. You know what's even better? Old person. There's so many better spells you can use than Rigid Thinking. So many better spells you can use. Because not only do they get the exact same save with 
uh, call lightning and hold person. But call lightning will basically one shot anything. And hold person has a chance to stun everybody around them on top of it. I just don't understand why this is here. Just like the others, this spell is just absolute garbage. I really can't think of a time where I'd be like, Yeah, rigid thinking, that's exactly what we need in this fight. It's just, you, you never use it. You never use it. There's no point. It might be fun to play with, maybe. But it has even has the same cast time as Hold Person. And it lasts the same duration. One turn. It just, it kills me. It might be fun to play with, but it just seems like absolute crap to me. C tier all the way. Up next, Spike Row. This is available to uh, Druid Shaman only. And this is actually a decent uh, Cloud Kill spell. This is lasts for one turn. So, you know, eight, eight rounds longer than crappy Cloud Burst up here. And this actually does physical damage, which is really different, right? Almost every single cloud kill spell in the game, that AoE that lasts on the ground, that does damage every round, will do magic damage. This one does physical. It'll do piercing and slashing. And what's great about this spell, six, uh, excuse me, six cast time, 15 foot radius, fairly standard for AoE spells. This will happen every round, but they'll take damage twice a round. So in Baldur's Gate 1, if there's a caster standing in this, they have a chance to get interrupted not once but twice, and there's no save. There's no save for this. If you're standing in it, you don't have stone skin or minor globe, you're going to get hit by this. And that's actually pretty damn useful. That's actually pretty damn useful. This damage doesn't seem like much. 1d4 plus 1d4, so that's 2d4, right? Doesn't seem much. But if you cast this, a couple of these, or combine it with some other AoE effects on the bandits, for example... That's where I typically end up using this most. On the bandits, really anything that's stationary. Archers especially, I like to use this a lot. You can combine this with web, and this, and then a couple other AoE spells, and they're just going to get cut to ribbons, dude. The fact that this lasts a full turn and does physical to interrupt is just great. Because enemies love to cast protection from fire on themselves, right? They love to cast protection from lightning, etc, etc, to make themselves immune to a lot of the AoE spells you would get. And that's why Cloud Kill is so good, is because it's poison. Incendiary Cloud hits really hard, but enemies almost always have protection from fire up. Wizards do, at least. And this will get around that. If an enemy has a stone skin up, this will actually break through the stone skin. And now, granted, you could say, like, well, I mean, it's breaking through the stone skin. Would it be better to actually, you know, hit him with a stone skin up? I guess it would. Sure. But breaking through the stone skin is still really damn useful. Especially when you don't have arrows of dispelling on early, right? Throwing this on to Veyron while he's sitting there, breaking through his stone skins while you're arching him down because you don't want to go into toe-to-toe -to -toe with him for whatever reason... This is actually pretty damn useful. There's a lot of situations where this actually turns out to be fairly decent. I wouldn't say it's amazing. This is definitely not an S tier spell, but I would put this at A just because I end up using this several times in the game and it ends up working out really well for me. The damage is always surprisingly meaningful. And that's really what I that's really what I like to say about a lot of Icewind Dale spells that turn out to be good. It's surprisingly meaningful, and this is one of them. For that reason, I leave it at A tier. It's actually way better than it looks on paper. It, the damage is surprisingly good. Obviously, it's not going to do shit to a bunch of skeletons uh, because they got physical damage reduction. But for the most part, this is surprisingly meaningful, and I like it. Up next is Storm Shell. This is a weird one. You've already heard me uh, talk about how much I absolutely can't stand pr the protection spells they get normally. This one's actually not that bad. This only affects the caster, but it makes them 50% resistance to fire, cold, and electricity. If you combine this with Armor of the Faith, the damage reduction is enough to prevent you from dying to any spell in Baldur's Gate 1. And it lasts for a full turn. A full turn. Unlike Protection from Fire, which is 3 plus 1 per level, which you get a level 5, which I guess you could say, well, it's 8 rounds, that's already not bad. This is only fire. This will protect you against fire, cold, and electrical. And 50% is a lot. It doesn't seem like a lot. But that's enough to really nullify insane difficulty. And getting hit by a fireball on normal rules is not that scary. So having this up, and again, combining it with Armor of the Faith, which you get a level 1, and you're pretty much guaranteed to survive any spell that's thrown at you. And that's pretty damn useful for a spell that you can just cast on before the fight and forget about and not have to worry. That's pretty damn useful. This isn't amazing. This isn't even A tier. I'd leave it at B tier. Just because there are times where, especially if your main character is a druid, you want to use this before fighting wizards. You do. This will keep your face pretty. This will stop you from having to make a brand new damn character. Because you're too lazy to cast one protection spell. When you're fighting the Veyorn, he doesn't just hit you with Fireball. He will happily use Lightning. He will happily use Kona Cold. He has a variety of spells to throw at you. So protection from fire isn't enough. But Storm Shell will keep you safe. And that's a great spell for that reason. Well, I wouldn't say great. You know what I mean. It's great in the sense that it will stop you from dying. Which is good. Good enough to where it is not C tier, it's B tier. I don't use it a lot. 
I typically only ever use this on the main character because if Jahira dies, who cares, right? It's Jahira. But on the main character, I don't want him to die. And this becomes actually fairly useful for that. Up next, Strength of One. Strength of One is an interesting spell. It's an AoE spell, very quick cast on a three, lasts one turn, 15 foot radius, and it brings everyone's strength to 1875. I find this spell to be useless. There are a lot of people who will disagree with me and tell me this spell is amazing and they use it all the time, and I'll tell you why I hate it. It lasts for one turn. One turn. If you cast this spell at the beginning of a fight, this spell is going to be great for boosting Kagan's strength and boosting your backline strength to a decent amount. This will help them land attacks more frequently and do more damage. For that and that reason alone, it is decent enough to be a B-tier spell. But if you have higher than 1875, it will lower your strength. But all you have to do is run them out of the range of the spell, right? So they don't get hit by it. Not a big deal. The thing is, you really don't use a lot of melee fighters in Baldur's Gate 1. And you don't need this at all in Baldur's Gate 2. In Baldur's Gate 1, you typically have Kagan and maybe one other frontliner if you're a frontliner on top of it. And that's it, right? For the most part, you're going to be stacking mages, clerics, and archers because ranging is just so much better in Baldur's Gate 1. It just really is. So you don't really need this for everybody. Edwin getting boosted to strength doesn't mean he's going to be landing his attacks more often with a sling. His stack is pathetic. If he gets a crit, he'll hit for a lot more damage. Big deal. Not important whatsoever. And in Baldur's Gate 2, Corian has higher strength than this. So this will actually reduce his strength. And you're going to be using a variety of items to boost strength, right? The belt, the gloves, etc., etc. To where you never want to really cast this anyways. You never really want to cast this anyways. And then it doesn't last long enough for you to, to carry equipment with it either. If this spell lasted for, like, say, a couple hours, I would say it'd be fairly decent, right? You could load up your companions with extra equipment, run back to town while carrying all that equipment, and then you could drop it off and sell it. Because a lot of companions have shit strength, right? They can't carry jack shit for equipment. If you just fight a group of uh, paladins wearing full uh, wearing plate mail and you want to go sell it, but your main character is a wizard, you have no chance of carrying that shit back to town. You could use this spell if it lasted longer, but it doesn't. And so it kills me. Like I said, it does enough of a Thacko and damage boost to the one or two frontliners that you're using in Baldur's Gate 1 to where this is probably worth casting, but not enough to merit it higher than B tier. Not enough to merit higher than B tier. No chance. For level 3 spell, I was hoping for something a little bit better than this. And even then, you could use the level 2 strength spell that wizards get that will last longer than this and just hit the one person who needs it. So you really don't need strength to 1. I guess, like I said, it does have a chance to boost the damage to your backline, but not sufficient enough to where I would ever take it on a reliable basis. I would never actually... I don't think I've actually taken it at all, to be honest. I don't think... In living memory, I can't think of a time where I actually took and used that spell. Up next is Summon Insects. Summon Insects is dropped down from S tier to A tier in my book. ICS finally got around to balancing this to make it a lot weaker than it used to be. However, it is still incredibly busted. Targets one creature, a very long cast time of nine, uh, lasts for seven rounds, saving throw and gates. The, cre the enemy has to save with a minus four penalty, otherwise they will take one point of piercing damage every two seconds for the duration of the spell. They will also fight with a minus two penalty to attack, minus two penalty to AC, and because of the spell biting, uh, because of the insect biting, their chance to cast a spell is almost, it's almost impossible. I don't think I've ever seen a single enemy in this game with an insect plague up and biting them that I actually got a spell off. It says 50% chance of spell failure, but every single time you get bit, that's also a chance to interrupt on top of the spell failure. This will not break stone skin. People who are protected from magical weapons are immune. People who have fire shield up are immune. And people who have cast death spell will destroy these. So there are a lot more spells to break this. Uh, I believe spell immunity conjuration also works as well. Yeah, conjuration will work to protect themselves from this, although it doesn't really happen that often. And this also does not do anything to undead. So there are a lot of restrictions here. That's why it's not S tier anymore. That's why it's A tier. But because they have to save with such a massive penalty... And because clerics have no defense against this whatsoever, aside from a uh, divine intervention, which they get a little bit later on, this is devastating. Absolutely devastating to hit on an enemy caster. If they don't have minor globe up, by all means, go for it. Try to hit him with the insects. This is still good on casting on fighters too. A minus two penalty to AC and attack isn't really all that much, but being constantly interrupted by bugs means they can't chase you down effectively and they can't kite effectively either. All these things combined make the spell very strong. Not S tier like it used to be, because all these are all these effects that SCS added are finally working and will actually kill them when used properly. And enemies will use them properly to make sure, because insects were so damn busted in the core game. 
In the original game, if you're playing without SES, this is 100% an S tier spell. Insect Plague, Creeping Doom, Summon Insects are also absurdly broken that you could basically solo every encounter in the game that has a wizard in it by just casting one of these spells. It's that damn good. It is that damn strong. It is absurd how powerful these things are. Because they can't cast shit. They can't cast a damn thing. And the duration is more than long enough to break through every spell protection they have. More than long enough to break through all their mirror, mirror images and stone skin. It's absurd how much damage these end up doing. Especially the Creeping Doom. If you get hit by a Creeping Doom on insane difficulty, it will actually kill you very, very quickly. You have like two rounds maybe before you die. If you don't cast an immunity before the, the, uh, the spell hits you, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. And this spell still works very great on enemy opponents too. This spell is almost enough to kill people in and of itself. The fact that it does the, these effects on top of it guarantees that you can follow it up with anything and murder them with impunity. Amazing spell. A tier all the way. Excuse me. Excuse me. A tier all the way. Very, very good. The only reason it's not S tier is because they have all these restrictions now that didn't used to be in the game. And for that reason, it's A tier and not S tier. But aside from that, those are really, really, really good. All right, uh, let's go. I think we have to go outside and rest real quick to unlock my level three uh, shaman spell, who, uh, which uh, name uh, escapes me at the moment. I can't remember what it's called. I know it's that stupid uh, cleanse shit. Okay, here it is. Spiritual Clarity. Targets one creature, very long cast time of nine, and it will purge the creature's mind of negative influences. It will remove fear, charm, confusion, and feeble mind from a single creature. Absolutely worthless. This will not make them immune, it will remove it. It will just remove it. That's it. You have remove fear. Remove fear does the same thing and hits everybody. If you want to get rid of fear, do that. Charm? That almost makes this worthwhile, because there's no good way of getting rid of charm right now, with the exception of exaltation, which we'll talk about in just a second. Actually, I'm not sure if Exaltation uh, works on Charm, so we'll talk about that in a second. So, with the newest version of SES, you actually have a lot of tools to deal with uh, mind-affecting spells. There's actually a lot of tools from Icewind Dale that actually work with mind-affecting spells. So, this spell doesn't... It, and originally, this used to be pretty decent, right? This used to be A tier, just because you didn't really have a good way of dealing with Charm, Confusion, or Feeble Mind. You really didn't have a good way. Well, Feeble Mind you did but uh, not Charm and Confusion. But the fact that you have so many tools to deal with that now really just makes this lackluster, especially considering this is a stupidly long cast time. So it's very, very easy for you to get interrupted if someone is confused and wailing on you or charmed and wearing on you and wailing on you. If this was a quick cast, like one, I would say this is an A tier spell, but it's not, it's nine. And for that, I'm gonna leave it at B tier because you will find use out of this, especially if you aren't using a cleric. But if you are, you have a better tool to use. You have a better tool to use. It's called Exaltation. We'll talk about it in a second. But I think this may indeed be the only thing that breaks Charm now, aside from Dispel Magic. And for that reason, I'm going to leave it at B tier. But it doesn't make you immune. It just cleanses it once, right? One time off, Fear, Charm, Confusion, Feeble Mind, that's it. So, for that, B tier. Not amazing, but not terrible. Alright, now we can finally talk about the Cleric. Oh, one sec here. Alright, there we go. Alright, Cleric. Uh, level 3. What do we got? Anima Dead. Anima Dead is S tier. Absolutely amazing summon. Cast time of 9, so very long cast time, but the duration is 8 hours, which is beyond busted. I don't think there's another summon in the game that lasts this long. There isn't another summon spell in the game that lasts this long. Levels 1 through 6, it's, it's 6. It's a regular 3 HD skeleton. It's just like the generic skeletons you see in BG1. At level 7 through 10, it's just like the skeletons you see with the helmet and uh, the long sword. Um, hits really hard, uh, has a decent MR, physical damage reduction, and then 11 and 15 and up, they start getting bigger and beefier and stronger. More damage reduction, more MR, more damage. This spell is an amazing tank in Baldur's Gate 1. Excuse me, in the original game, uh, Baldur's Gate 2, no mods. This is an absolutely amazing tank. They are practically immune to magic. You could actually use these to kill beholders very, very effectively. You could use these to absorb a buttload of spells from enemy liches and wizards, and they just cannot seem to do anything to them because they have so much MR. This has been nerfed greatly in SES. They die fairly easily in SES despite having all these protections, um, just because beholders are absolutely busted in SES. They are very, very powerful. Enemy uh, spellcasters will have better ways to deal with them. They'll have control undead, which seems to always work on summons. 
So if you cast this on a Lich, he will take control of it and send it right back at you. So these aren't as good with SES, but they're still really, 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 really good. They are great for tanking physical damage. They're great for tanking magic damage. And you really can't ask for a better tank than this for a level three spell. That is absolutely insane. And it scales better as time goes on. For a level three spell, this is one of the best summons you can get. And again, it lasts for eight hours. Most summon spells are a turn if you're lucky. This lasts for hours, man. I don't know why this spell is so loaded, but it is. Very, very strong. Very, very good. If you need a summon, take this spell. One through six, these are almost worthless. But as soon as you hit level seven on a cleric, as soon as you hit level seven, this summon becomes dynamite. Try it out. Play around with it. You'll find these to be very, very good. Up next, we have Cure Disease. Uh, Cure Disease will target... Um, excuse me, Cause Disease will target one creature and will sap them with 5d4 points of strength. Very long cast number 9. Lasts for 8 hours. Touch spell. Um, if they save, they, uh, no, absolutely nothing happens. But if they fail their save, they will lose 5d4 points of strength. On paper, this looks amazing, right? 5d4 points of strength. That means they can lose up to 20 strength. You know what does the same thing? Rave Enfeeblement that mages get at level 2. That we don't really find all that useful. This is a longer cast time. And you have to touch them to actually pull it off. No save penalty either, either, and it doesn't work for undead, constructs, or extraplanar creatures. If you could cast this on a golem, that would be spicy. You can't. And it also can't be cast by good aligned characters. This spell is so underwhelming, it's amazing. If I want to reduce somebody's strength, I'm going to use Ray of Enfeeblement, not this shit. I'm going to cast it from the backline from a wizard. The other thing you got to keep in mind is that Ray of Enfeeblement and Cause Disease, enemies are not uh, beholden to encumbrance, I should say. That's the best way to do it. If you're carrying too much shit beyond your strength capacity, you can't move. That doesn't happen for enemies. If an enemy is wearing full plate and you hit him with Raven Feeblement, he should technically be only able to carry 15 pounds. So he should stop moving, right? That's not how it works. Enemies are not beholden to that set of rules. So if you hit somebody with this or Raven Feeblement, they can keep on walking. They don't give a fuck. If this actually did do that and stop them from moving, that would be fairly useful. But again, at the same time, that's... Just as good as a hold spell, which also doesn't have a penalty to saving, which is AoE, which lasts a turn and makes it guaranteed that every single attack lands on them. And this is a level 3 spell, so it doesn't even go through a variety of spell protections. So it just kills me. This spell could have been good, but it's not. If this came with a penalty, I'd be almost tempted to use it. But there's no penalty, long cast time, have to be in melee, the duration is completely irrelevant, it just... And, in, and you can't use it on the one thing you really want to use it on, which is golems. And they have MR anyway, so. But still. Bad spell. C tier all the way. Up next, we have Cause Medium Wounds. This is the uh, damage version of Cure Medium Wounds. Uh, these are Cleric only, by the way, in case it wasn't obvious. I'll target one creature and do 3d8 plus one per level. Not bad. Not bad. Not amazing, but not bad. Clerics really don't get any damage here. They get Glyph Awarding, and that's it. And Glyph Awarding is pretty terrible. Um, they also get Holy Smite, which can be useful, but we'll talk about that in just a second, why I don't typically use that. But this is really the only targeted damage spell they get. They get the save first half, but it has a decent cast time of 5, although you do have to be in melee again. I don't use this spell, but I could see a time where you may actually want to use it. I'm still going to leave it at C tier, I think. Excuse me. The one you get at level 2, at level 3, it's just like your medium, right? 2d8 plus 1 per level is, is literally better as a level 2 spell, then 3d8 plus 1 per level as a level 3 spell. So personally, I find this to be more useful than this. So I'm going to leave this at C tier while this one is B tier. I know that sounds confusing, but don't forget, it takes two levels to go from 2 to 3, right? Two levels. Call Lightning, every time you get a level, jumps up by 1d8. If this did 4d8 instead of two, instead of 3, that would actually make sense and make it more useful, but it doesn't. It's 3d8, and for that reason, I'm leaving it at C tier spell. It does a decent chunk of damage, but they can still save. And if they save, this does almost nothing. So, kills me. Not a big fan. Um, I'm going to pass on that one. I can see you making use out of it for a certain combination of classes. For example, if you are a fighter cleric and you need some extra raw damage to finish off somebody because you don't have that many attacks per round, you can weave in a cause medium wounds. That would be decent, but I still think it's C tier. Still think it's C tier. Up next, Circle of Bones. I hate this spell. C tier all the way for me. Uh, last one round per level. Casting time of three. I cannot be cast by good characters. And what it will do is it will basically make a blade barrier around you that does 1d6 crushing and 1d6 uh, uh, slashing per round. They don't get a save versus this. So on paper, this looks good. But when you cast this, you cannot move. 
Which means that if you're getting attacked by somebody who you don't want to be in melee with, or you're getting shot, or there's a spell coming at you that you need to dodge, you can't. You're forced to sit there and eat it and almost invariably die because of it. And for that reason, I absolutely hate this spell. If you could move while casting with this, I would probably put this at A tier. I would probably put this at A tier. And you could also throw on Sanctuary, or cast this, throw on Sanctuary, and walk into melee, run around in circles, and do a buttload of damage, and people can't do anything to you in Baldur's Gate 1. But you can't move with this, right? You can't move. If you could, it would be nice, but you can't. So it's just, I don't understand how you could really make good use out of the spell. I just don't. Maybe if you're stupidly tanky, and you're fighting enemies who are only melee, you don't have to worry about archers, or rangers, or mages, and the melee enemies you're fighting aren't going to ever do remotely close to being enough damage to hurt you. You can cast this spell and do a little bit of extra DPS, but what a complete waste, dude. What an absolute waste of a spell. C tier all the way. Up next we have Exaltation. Exaltation will target uh, one creature, a uh, party member, and it will remove fear, sleep, feeble mind, unconsciousness, intoxication, berserk, and confused states of mind. This does not say charm, and I don't believe this works on charm. I'll test it to be absolutely sure. But, um, this will also make you immune for one turn. And that's why this spell is so much damn better than the, than the uh, shaman one. Because now you're immune to this crap. This works on wing buffet from dragons. This will make, uh, Kagan not get, uh, um... Uh, this will protect him from a stupid, uh, fatigue shit afterwards. Uh, this will uh, protect you against a wizard who's chain-popping chaos spells. The Iron Throne loves to cast chaos spells. A lot of wizards cast chaos not just once, but more than once, to make sure they hit your whole damn party. This will make you immune to a full damn turn of that shit. Sleep and fear are irrelevant. At this point in the game, you literally can't get go to sleep, except for the rare occasion where people are using um, the level 4 uh, mage spell, whose name completely escapes me. Emotion hopelessness. Um, and that's it. That's it. Fear, you're going to have Remove Fear. You're not going to rely on Exaltation. Remove Fear is way better at that. So the, limita the limitations of this spell are pretty significant, but there is really no good way of dealing with Berserking, with uh, with uh, Confusion in this game outside of Berserking. If you don't have Berserk, Exaltation is amazing for that situation. You literally never have to worry about your main character getting confused ever in Baldur's Gate 1 if you have a Cleric with Exaltation. It's really, really useful for that. That's why it's really good. I leave it at A tier. I think that may be overrating it potentially, but in situations where you are going to get hit with more than one chaos, this spell is absolutely mandatory. If you do not have it, you are almost certainly going to get confused, and that is almost certainly going to be game over for you. Very long cast time, but again, I don't use this in combat. I don't use this as a remove. I use this as a pre-buff because a turn is more than long enough for this to actually make you immune because chaos always come out right out the gate, right? Chaos are, is almost always cast immediately at the start of a fight by enemy wizards. So you don't have to worry about this coming up later in a fight. For that reason, I'm going to leave it at A tier. Really good. Not absolutely game-breaking, but strong enough to where when you need this spell and you have it, it makes all the difference in the world. Alright, what do we got next here? Next is Favorite Ill Matter. Uh, this is a spell that cannot be cast by evil aligned creatures. Uh, it will target one creature, and the cleric and the target's creature's hit points will be swapped. Has a decent cast time of 6, you don't have to touch, but it does have a limitation of 30 feet. So if you have a warrior on the front line and your cleric in the back is full HP, your warrior's taking tons, you can use your cleric to swap HP values. So the warrior will now have the cleric HP, and the cleric will now have the warrior HP. The spell won't work at all if the cleric has uh, less HP than the fighter. So keep that in mind. And if you're using it on somebody like... Um, if you're using it on somebody who's in melee, that you plan on meleeing with a cleric, this can be really, really dangerous. I typically don't use this spell ever. Just because I am frequently more worried about my backline getting hit by a spell or some other bullshit than I am about my frontline dying. Corrigan is unironically one of the safest companions you can have in Baldur's Gate 2. With Berserking, he's immune in his uh, shorty saves. He's immune to decapitation from the planar, uh, from the um, from the fallen planetar. He's t pretty much immune to petrification. Uh, he's immune to a bunch of crap. And if you give him elemental resistance gear on top of it, chances are he's not going to get popped by a fireball or lightning bolt either. I am worried about my clerics even when I sleep. I am always worried about my backline dying, despite the fact that they should have way more immunities than he does. Because all it takes is you not paying attention for one second, them losing a buffer protection, and them getting hit with a spell. Because they have no HP, it's stupidly easy for them to get popped. And what this will do is will make them have even less HP. 
if you want to heal somebody, use a heal. Don't use favor of ill matter. There could be times where you have somebody who's stunned and you just need them to live for like another round or two and you don't have time to cast a heal spell or you don't have heal yet in Baldur's Gate 1, you could swap your HP with Favor of Ill Matter and save them. Maybe you got jumped by spiders, one of your party members is webbed, maybe your main character is webbed and poisoned and you don't have a slow poison and you just need them to survive a couple more rounds to break out of the web, you can use this to give them all of your cleric's HP and have them swap. He's still poisoned, and that still might not be enough to save him, but you might be able to save him with that spell. And for that reason, I'm going to leave it at B tier, just because there are times where you could potentially make use out of this. But for the most part, it's really, really risky. Really, really risky. Up next is Glyph of Warding. This is basically a shitty version of Skull Trap that uh, clerics get. Uh, it's a cast time of 9. We'll drop a little ward on the ground with a 12-foot radius. They can save versus uh, spell to take half damage. But instead of doing 1d6 per level, this does 1d4 per level, and it's electrical damage on top of it. Oh wait, they, they can save our spell to escape completely. That's right, I forgot. They get to see, If you successfully save, the spell does nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. And that just makes it crap for me. It just makes it terrible. Not only is it way weaker than Skull Trap, it does electrical damage, not pure magic, which could be useful at times, but the enemies who have more MR than anything are undead. And guess who's completely immune to electrical damage? It starts with a U and ends in undead. Actually, I take that back. Gas and... uh. Gas are not immune to, to lightning, neither are uh, vampires. Skeletons are the ones who are immune to uh, to uh, lightning damage. So I do got to clarify that. Skeletons are the ones who are immune to cold, lightning, and have decent MR. So I guess really Skull Trap doesn't help you in that situation either, but still. 1d4 as opposed to 1d6 sucks, and if they successfully save, they take no damage at all. There's really no good reason to ever use this. No good reason to ever use this. Maybe if you have a fighter in the front line who's wearing boots of Talos and he's got Helm of Glory on and he just chugged a potion of absorption and you need to heal him but you don't want to get in melee and you want to do a little bit of damage at the same time, you can cast a Glyph Awarding that does a little bit of electrical damage to boost up his HP and deal a little bit of damage at the same time. I don't know. It's so convoluted and so stupid. I don't think I ever take this spell, ever. Only time you'd ever take this is if maybe you have an Illusionist and you want to like try to kill... Uh, Try to kill Chandelar and you don't have anybody to cast Skull Trap, you could drop a million of these and then pop them and pray that he somehow gets hit by enough to kill him. So, C tier all the way. Up next, Holy Smite. Holy Smite is interesting. Holy Smite will do 1d4 points per level, um, and on a, upon a successful save, they'll take half, and if they fail their save, they're also blinded for one round, and this will only hit evil creatures. I almost exclusively pay, play evil in my party. I almost exclusively play evil in my party, so I almost never use this spell ever because I'm just going to be hitting my own damn party members. And on Insane, this damage is surprisingly meaningful. For enemies though, it's not. 1d4 damage is not a lot, um, although you are fighting for the most part. You are fighting uh, evil creatures for the most part in this game. There are very, very few times where you'll be fighting neutral or even rare good, um, good enemies. So you will get a lot of use out of Holy Smite if you are a good party. Because again, there really isn't great damage spell for clerics, right? There really isn't. Druids get Call Lightning. Druids get um, the Spike Shell, the Spike Growth crap. They get uh, Mold Touch. They get Insects. They have a couple tools to play with for damage. Uh, clerics have nothing here. Clerics have absolutely nothing to do damage. And so Holy Smite's really it. Holy Smite's really it. And it does a decent amount of damage, but not a lot. And if you really want to get them blinded, you know, Powered Blind is not too far away. And if you want to actually, if you really need to land a blind on somebody who's really busted, you want to cast blind and combine it with a Doom or a Malison, you know? I just, I don't really find myself using this. If you play a good party, I can see this being fairly decent. B, possibly even A tier, especially if you're running multiple clerics, having multiple people cast this along with your other AoE spells from Wizards. You could do a lot of AoE damage fairly quickly and effectively. But if you're playing evil, if you're taking Edwin in the party or Vicky or Corrigan, you're going to find this doing more damage to your party than the enemies and... You don't want to help the enemies. You want to help your party. So for that reason, I leave it at B tier. Just because if you are good, this is good. But if you're evil or having even just one or two evil characters in your party, you never want to cast this. Too risky. Up next is Prayer. Prayer is kind of like Chant, but not quite as good. All attacks, damage, and saving throws by uh, friendly creatures get a plus one bonus. And enemy attacks, damage, and saves get a minus one penalty. This isn't quite the same as Luck, right? This isn't quite the same as Chant, but it's kind of like Chant. It's a little bit of a weaker version of Chant. Lasts one round per level. So uh, when you first get level three spells, you're level five. So this lasts a minimum of five rounds per level and scales up to 20 rounds per level. So two turns max. Not amazing. But it also puts a negative penalty in your enemies, so you can combine this with Chant, 
and you could actually hit a couple and you could basically stack these effects fairly quickly if you want you could use a sequencer as a cleric uh mage and you could cast chant prayer and then the fourth uh, version which is recitation all at once instantly giving your entire party a nice boost and putting penalties on enemies that add up fairly quickly fairly quickly this isn't as good as chant this is only a tier but it's still good enough to where if you are not casting anything else as a cleric if you are not casting a hold or if you're not casting a heal if what you're doing is not absolutely critical that you get off asap this is one of the better spells you can cast this is definitely one of the better spells you can cast and for that it's a tier the bonuses stack with chant they stack with uh multiple prayers do not stack just like multiple chants do not stack but you can stack this with chant recitation uh righteous wrath of the faithful and you could basically turn a party of a bunch of apes into a pretty damn strong party. And for that reason, it's A tier. I cast this fairly frequently. I would say I use this in chant almost every fight, but it's just not as good as chant, so I don't feel confident enough leaving it as an S tier spell. I apologize, I have to keep blowing my nose. My nose is running like fucking crazy today. It's it's so awful that Corona had to come mid mid uh mid uh pollen with allergy season, right? So now you get the combination of the two, so you're like do I need to go to the hospital, or I just need to go and take some Allegra? I don't know what the hell I do here. All right, up next is Remove Curse. Remove Curse is B tier. It, all it does is target an enemy or a, a player and removes the curse on them. Big deal. Um, permanent, cast time of six. The only time you really ever use this is if you're A, dumb enough to actually wear some cursed gear. Typically doesn't happen. Or B, you're fighting the golems in Baldur's Gate 2, which will throw up a curse that prevents them from being healed. That's the only time you ever use this spell. Curses are very rare in Baldur's Gate. I don't think there's actually a spell in the game that's categorized as a curse. There might be... Unholy Blight might be categorized as a curse. But, um... Chances are you're not going to be using this spell ever. Unless you're fighting golems. Or if you accidentally throw on some cursed equipment. That's it. There's really nothing else to say about it. It's a B tier spell because it will have use. But don't have this memorized unless you know you're going to use it. Complete waste. Up next, Remove Paralysis. Remove Paralysis is actually really good. This is an A tier spell. Um, I wouldn't say it's S tier, but it's definitely A tier. I've lost a lot of characters to hold. I have hold is probably if you don't include Planetars and you don't include Cloakwood, hold has probably killed more characters in my party than any other spell in the game, and I really mean that. Hold has killed more main characters than I can think of any other spell. I know. Uh, I, I could I could talk about the list of characters that have died from being held, and it's just it depresses me every time I think about it. Cast time is 6, but this is an AoE freedom, right? This will hit multiple uh, allied creatures. So if you have a large group of people who got hit by a whole person, this will free them all. Which is really nice. This will work up to uh, power with stun. This will work on hold effects from items. Uh, this is really, really good. This is really, really good. This doesn't work on everything. A stun effect, the one that has the little uh, feeble mind icon, remove paralysis doesn't do anything for that. So this will work on actual paralysis or actual holding spells. This does not work on stuns. Stuns are different, so keep that in mind. But this is still really, really good. A tier all the way. This will save your ass many times throughout Baldur's Gate. I always have a remove paralysis memorized, always. Every time I have a cleric, I always have this spell. It's almost mandatory. Up next, Rigid Thinking. We already talked about it before, same with Strength of Wands. So we only got two more spells here, Unholy Blight and Zone of Sweet Air, finally. Almost done. So Unholy Blight is kind of like the opposite of, um, Kind of like the opposite of a uh, holy smite, right? Channel between it and the targets. The result is that any good creatures will take 1d4 points of damage or half upon a successful save. And if they fail their save, they receive a minus two penalty to all their rolls for four rounds. Big deal. You never fight good creatures in this game. Never. You may fight a couple paladins. And uh, I think the ambush at the oasis is the only time where you'll actually come across good enemies that you'll be fighting. Also, if you're evil in hell. Uh, the elves, the flaming fist guards that are being spawned are good, so you can hit them with holy blight, unholy blight. That's it. This spell does too little damage. Has a very quick cast time of three. Was holy smite three as well? Yeah, it is. So the cast time is quite good, but it does way too little damage. Way too little damage. And if you are playing good, you never want to use this anyways. So for me, this is C tier spell. I th you get a lot more use out of holy smite because you're fighting evil enemies way more often. You almost never fight good. If this were for neutral too, it wouldn't be that bad. But it's good only. And that makes it crap. Absolute crap. This is irrelevant. I I'm not even going to read it again. It's too worthless. Not worth my time. And lastly, we have Zone of Sweet Air. Zone of Sweet Air repels all noxious elements from poisonous vapors. So what this does is it dispels Stinking Cloud, Cloud Kill, and uh, I think this actually works on Writhing Fog as well, the Shaman one. In fact, you know what? Let's try it out real quick. 
Let's try it out real quick just to make sure that I'm not actually crazy, because it's entirely possible I am crazy. I don't think it will work, but it's possible it does. Let's see what we got here, boys. All right, it works. There you go. So it'll work on Writhing, uh, Writhing Fog as well. Not like it matters, considering that damn spell only lasts for two rounds anyways. But it w does seem to dispel all the cloud kill effects. This will definitely not work on Spike Growth. I know that for a fact. Um, but this is great, because I, I wouldn't say this is a great spell. Very rarely, if you are getting hit by multiple cloud kills or you're stuck in a poison cloud, chances are you're going to get knocked unconscious and you won't get this off. What I typically use this for is for when I'm dropping a buttload of cloud kills to kill enemies, I can then cast Zone of Sweet Air to get rid of the cloud kill and then charge in and finish them off. Because if you run into cloud kills on insane difficulty, even this Corgan, you're going to die really quickly. That damage adds up very 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 fast and zone of sweet air allows you to get around that and uh run in and take them down so really again nothing amazing nothing super cool you can use with this spell the obvious you know if you get hit with a cloud kill or a poison stinking cloud or something like that you can get rid of it zone of sweet air i almost always end up taking this spell because cloud kill is one of my favorite spells and i use it all the damn time so for that reason i usually end up taking this i'm still going to leave it at b tier i don't think this is an amazing spell but there are going to be times where you want to use it for both offensive and defensive purposes all right, that is it for us, boys. Thank you so much for watching. I apologize it took us so long to get these in the, in the Spell 2 up. We finally got it done. I know I say a lot of things up here that are confusing or you think are crap. If you disagree with me, let me know in the comments. Tell me about your favorite spell. Tell me about what I missed. If there's some uh, spell that you think that I rated horribly that you use all the time and you love, let me know, dudes. I want to hear about it. Until next time, thank you as always for watching. God bless you, my friends. We'll see you next time.